Do you ever have the sense that there is something blocking you from a fuller expression of the gifts that you bring to bear? The real genius that you could share in order to benefit your life and the lives of those around you. If that's the case for you, then I do hope you'll continue watching because in this video, I'm going to talk through a few ideas on how you can better embody the kind of mindset that makes the realization of those farthest dreams possible. And I submit to you from the outset that one of the things that keeps people's true ability, true creative potential caged is a failure to let the thoughts they have about what's possible to them, failure to let those thoughts take up residence in their living flesh. What I mean is they get so caught up in the abstractions that they never actually embody those things and make them concrete in the way they sit and stand and walk and talk. Again, if these ideas remain abstract and they aren't given an embodiment, in an enactment, in our flesh, then they're impotent. That, I would suggest, is one of the primary ways that we keep ourselves from what would otherwise be available to us. So let's talk about this idea of getting stuck somehow. I've got a couple of companions with me today that I think will shed some light on the situation here. Regarding this stuckness, there's a line from Felix Guattari's essay, The Three Ecologies, that I think captures something really beautiful in the way that the words are organized. And so he writes, or it's translated, the unconscious remains bound to archaic fixations only as long as there is no investment directing it towards the future. We remain bound to archaic fixations in the absence of this investment directing it toward the future. Now, you, of course, you have these goals, these dreams, these visions of what might be possible for yourself and for the world around you. And yet there's this interesting idea of no investment directing it toward the future. And quite often in the, the business space, the performance space, when we talk about investment, especially when people are really trying to sell us on a thing, they talk about investing your time, investing your money, investing your attention. These are all well and good. They're, they're not, not a part of a, a situation. It will likely take time and money and attention and cash to bring to fruition some of the things that you'd like. And yet I would suggest that that's not the primary investment. I think this word investment is a really important thing for us to consider. And it has a kind of physicality to it. There's a, a material to the word investment if we follow it back to its roots. So etymologically, investment means something like to wear. It's what we dress ourselves in. And it has this similar root to things like, well, a vest that you might wear or to like this a bit more, to the vestments that you would see uh, the clergy members wear, which I suggest has this religious connotation to the word investment. When we are invested in something, it suggests a kind of uh, devotional practice to that thing. Now, if I can make a little linguistic leap over here, this vestment idea also brings to mind for me uh, the habits that nuns might wear. Again, a kind of religious garb in which they dress themselves. And we can see this fun hominin here with the habits we have cultivated. So that future vision you have, it's going to be brought into being by certain behaviors that you take part in day after day, week after week, month after month. These behaviors, when they become standard parts of your repertoire, these are the habits that you develop. And what I would suggest is that the habits in which you dress yourself ought to be derived from the kind of future that you would like to dwell within. Again, if I can just read this verbatim, the unconscious remains bound to archaic fixations only so long as there is no investment directing it towards the future. 
which is to say that the future, the, the dream that you're attempting to realize, it asks something of the habits in which you dress yourself now. This is the, the really beautiful thing about the psychic nature of images or the imagistic nature of psyche. A good image organizes our behavior. An image calls for us to meet it in some way. So we might wonder, well, okay, there's this investment directing us toward the future. Uh, maybe this is a, a nice sounding idea about dressing myself in some behaviors, adopting certain habits, but Chandler, what the hell are you getting at here? Well, well I would suggest to you that if you're going to dress yourself in anything, uh, you may as well dress yourself beautifully. And I don't mean that in terms of like some pretty thing. I'm gonna turn toward James Hillman here in the Uniform Edition, collected works of James Hillman, this one in particular, uh, City and Soul, and it's volume two. So he turns toward Plotinus and the Enneads going way, way back. And citing Plotinus, talking about beauty and ugliness, he says, an ugly thing is something that has not been entirely mastered by form. Which is to say, an ugly thing has no encompassing and profound idea of what the thing wants to be. The ugly thing is confused about what it is and what it is becoming. Mm. So if we have this dream, this future that we would like to dwell in, if we have a beautiful image of what we're attempting to realize, that suggests that a beautiful image knows what it is and it acts like it. The ugly is lacking in contemplative thought about itself. It therefore cannot be truly what it is. It is not true to itself, and consequently, it cannot be beautiful or do good. Oof. Let's let that wash over us for a few moments. Uh, the ugly has not been sufficiently mastered by form. The ugly is not informed by what it is and what it is becoming. So there's something teleological about this. There's something the teleological meaning something like the speech of the end. So we're, we're informed by what we're going to be. If I have a vision of the future that I'm attempting to realize, I can dress myself in the garb of that. I can invest myself in that image. Now, what's a good image? A good image, not technically good, but okay, a beautiful image, let's say, is something that is true to itself. Something that has a profound and encompassing idea of what it's to be. Now, bear with me, because again, this might sound like a nice sounding idea, and again, I hope at the very least you're wondering, well, Chandler, what's to be done with this? You said how to embody the mindset that makes possible these farthest dreams. So I'm going to turn to an earlier essay of Hillman's here. So if we're looking for beauty, Hillman says, the road to beauty means for the ego to enter into conditions like those of beauty. The first of these is pleasure. So what does that mean? What Hillman is suggesting here is that if we want to create something more beautiful for ourselves, we have to create conditions like those of beauty. And he says that we know beauty bodily through the experience of pleasure. Hmm. So I wonder, when was the last time you really gave yourself to conditions of beauty? When was the last time you actually reveled in the experience of pleasure on a sensory basis? I can think of a couple of instances this week that come to mind for me. One is after a, a very high volume training session of squats, walking back from the weight room, I found my center of gravity was lower and I just, I like, 
I felt like some jungle animal walking on the streets. My legs just kind of came one after the other after the next, and there was some really sensuous, pleasant quality in my gait, being so fatigued from the work in the weight room previously. And then just last night, I went to the one, of mar one of the markets around here to get some produce for the week. And as I was bagging the carrots, I caught this whiff of the greens and I, <laughs> the cashier saw me, I stopped and I smelled the greens for a moment. And then we made awkward eye contact as I put the thing in the bag and we had a good laugh about it. But what I'll suggest to you is that if you can make a practice of pleasure in the body, this will give you a felt sense of the kinds of experiences that will likely help you bring that beautiful vision into being. Again, for us to cultivate beauty in our lives, we have to be receptive to the beautiful. If we haven't awakened our aesthetic sensibilities and become keenly attuned to how our animal flesh responds to beauty and to ugliness, then we're numb, we're anesthetized. And then of course, we have a hard time organizing our behavior toward some beautiful future. We're hardly responsive to beauty in the moment. So a practice, if I can guide you through a practice. I encourage you, I'll invite you, I would suggest that right now, you look around the room and you find something beautiful and you find something ugly. Let me find something. Ah, there's my something ugly. So I've got something beautiful here, and I've got something ugly there. Take a couple of moments for yourself. Find some beautiful thing, and find some ugly thing. So, if you have those things ready, direct your attention toward that beautiful thing. And eh, I'll direct my attention to you right now. You can be that beautiful thing for me. Direct your attention to that beautiful thing. And notice as you do so, what effect that has on your body. Notice what changes in the experience of being you when you contemplate the beautiful. Give that a few moments. Let that experience take root within you then would you shift your attention to that ugly thing? And notice in the first couple of moments, what changes? When you contemplate the ugly thing, don't you just recoil within yourself a bit? Don't you seem to get heavy and sluggish? Don't you brace some? Now, shift your attention a few times slowly toward that beautiful thing and toward that ugly thing. And notice the contrast here. Notice the distinction in your embodied experience between contemplation of the beautiful and the experience of pleasure associated with it. Contrast that with the displeasure that arises in contemplation of the ugly. If you shift your attention between the two, it likely becomes clearer and clearer, not just intellectually, but in your flesh, it becomes clearer that one of these is quite preferable to the other. One of these potentiates you in a way, it, it draws you out of yourself, right? When you contemplate the beautiful, aren't you just pulled a bit toward it? Aren't you energized, motivated, expansive in a way? Whereas the ugly, I believe Hillman also said in Plotinus says, the ugly, it, uh, it turns us inward. We recoil from the ugly. So why is this so important? Well, if you could cultivate more experiences of pleasure, more experiences that draw you into, into the conditions of beauty. You can see that in your experience of yourself, you're more available for the world. You're more available for work in those moments. Whereas in the conditions of ugliness, 
oh, everything is harder. It's a strain. Yeah. You have to push through some muck. Now, I'll read a third section from Hillman here. Burnout comes when practice does not have a vision. And you don't really know what ideal you're putting daily into practice. Or burnout can come when you have a vision that cannot reach into practice. So he's saying that if we want to avoid burnout, well, he's not saying that. I, I would say that he's suggesting if we want to avoid burnout and make our work sustainable, we have to find this balance between aesthetics and ethics. We have to yoke our work to pleasure in a way, such that the beauty of our vision is calling us to work in conditions like those of beauty, which is to say that if we want beautiful ends, we would do well to practice beautiful means. The manner of our approach is what's going to make possible that particular outcome. And we're only ever going to know if we're on track in the manner of our approach, the means whereby, if we are keenly attuned to the aesthetic response in its manifest embodiment moment to moment. We have, through this evolutionary inheritance of our flesh, we have the means to determine when we're engaged in beautiful practice or when we're engaged in ugly toil and strain. However, most of us have become anesthetized. We've numbed to this aesthetic response, in part because the ugly, ugh, it's painful. Our perception is, ugh, we're affronted by the ugly. So many of us make the naive mistake of numbing entirely. We blunt our perception of ugliness and that costs us our perception of beauty. And then we simply can't help but go through the motions. So where, where do we find ourselves now? Or where do I find myself now? Well, I'd suggest that if you want to embody the kind of mindset that makes possible your farthest visions, the dreams you have, for the kind of future that you'd like to dwell within, I'll suggest that part of that embodiment means making a deliberate practice to cultivate the conditions of beauty. When you practice cultivating the conditions of beauty, noticing the aesthetic response within your flesh, finding experiences of pleasure in your day-to-day -day life, you not only make yourself more available for the work required by that beautiful future, but you are informed as to what you need to focus on, right? Our focus is in the cultivation and the preservation of the beautiful. And it's in remedying ugliness when we see it. It's not to step over the ugly or simply avert our gaze. When we see and perceive the ugly, it's painful and we're outraged by it. We ought to then be able to take that mobilization and address the problem at hand rather than simply numbing ourselves to that painful perception. So what I'm suggesting is that awareness of beauty and awareness of ugliness and awareness of your felt response to the beautiful and the ugly is how you can begin to take these ideas of peak performance and actually embody and enact these. Because after all, performance means like giving shape through, right? Per forma, this means shaping through. So we can shape through these actions. Sorry, a little pop-up over here. We can shape ourselves through these actions. These actions that are beautiful. These actions that are pleasurable. And again, this doesn't always mean that it like feels good, like little bubble baths and things in the moment. I earlier gave the example of that really sensuous satisfaction I had after that heavy squat session. It took a lot of work and exertion prior to getting that really pleasurable quality. So it's not like we just kick back and ooze in this 
perpetual womb. It's not saying that because some of the most pleasurable experiences are on the other side of a lot of work. There's a difference though between a lot of work that leads to pleasure and a lot of work that leads to pain. And people who have numbed themselves to pleasure and to pain, people who have numbed themselves to beauty and ugliness, they can't tell the difference. So can I leave you with one other practice, here? something you might do to actually uh, let this sink in yet another layer? What I would suggest is that you consider the five primary senses. There's what? Sight and smell and hearing, uh, taste and uh, touch. For each of those five primary senses, reflect on a favorite memory associated with each of those senses. Favorite memory, the, the most beautiful thing you remember seeing, or a favorite memory associated with the experience of touch, favorite memory associated with a smell, with a taste, with a with a whatever the hell the fifth one is that I'm forgetting. Ah, a favorite sound, favorite thing you've heard. So if you spend a little time reflecting on these five primary senses and a memory associated with each, perhaps that gives you some clue as to how you might create more beautiful conditions for yourself in the present. And what I would suggest is that if you can create a more beautiful environment for yourself, wherever it is that you work or live or spend your time in between, whatever the case is, there's something about beautiful environments that calls us out of ourselves. It makes us more available for the work that the world is begging for these days. So that's a whole lot of talking for me for the day. I hope this is of some use for you as well in terms of how you can begin to actually embody the mindset that makes possible the realization of your farthest dreams. Again, I suggest that in large part that comes from making your life a beautiful practice. And the way that you do that is by recognizing the conditions of beauty. First among them is the experience of pleasure. So in order to consolidate this, when you give a little thought to, out of everything I've discussed thus far in this video, what is the one idea that really sticks with you? What is the difference that makes a difference for you? And would you drop that in the comments down below so that we can begin to glean from the wisdom of multiple perspectives? What you'll see is that if you drop something there and you see other people drop something there, you'll notice what they noticed. And maybe that gives you a different way to think about these ideas. You can come to a more nuanced understanding of them. And you can contribute to a more nuanced understanding by distilling down the difference that makes a difference. I'll also say that if you'd like a little more focused support in implementing these ideas, you can book a call with me directly. We can see if it's a good fit to do more intensive work together. The link for that is speakwithchandler.com. I'll also, in the description down below, drop uh, some information about how the Grounded Founder Framework can be implemented in uh, a group context, which is a really rich environment as well. So be well. Thank you for your attention. And I will look forward to speaking with you very soon.